If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me very quickly. I want to look at the story in that season leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ. We sang a song about a prophetic word that had taken place. But today I want to look at an event, an event that led to that fulfillment. And I'm turning to Luke chapter 1 even right now. Luke chapter 1. If you've got Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 5. And here the Word of God says, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zechariah. He was of the cause of Abijah. And his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his cause, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of people were praying without at a time of incense. And there, in verse 11, appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call him John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice in his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the judge, the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angels, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. Verse 19, And the angel answering and unto him said, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show you these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and shalt not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou hast believed not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Verse 21, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his administration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus had the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. May the Lord just bless the reading of this word. And here we find a very interesting passage of Scripture. Not something that often is read at Christmas. Because in Christmas, we always think of the nativity scene, we think of the shepherds, we think of the wise men, we think of the baby being born in that manger. But preceding this, there was an event. And this event was included in the Bible for a special reason. It was to show the importance of the ministry of a forerunner, somebody who was coming to declare a message, somebody that was coming to prepare the way. And this is important because 
even as we have sometimes prepared for Christmas. Perhaps we have not prepared ourselves even in anticipation and leading up to the celebration. And we are so focused on the celebration that we have not prepared ourselves. And we can also miss the mark. So here, there was this special significance. And you find this happen in a temple. In a very important time in the life of the father-to-be, who was a priest. Now, there are many lessons for us. And this is something that I want to just touch upon to share. I may not be able to exegize every single lesson, but I just want to touch on a few important ones. You know, many of us live our lives as believers, certainly, I believe, like Zechariah. He lived his life to follow God, and in his love, he served God as a priest. And he was probably a man of faith, a man who has been trusting God and trusting God, and he has been praying and praying and asking God for perhaps a son. You know, in the old days, if you are without a child, it is a dishonor to a man. And so that might have been a desire. And he's waited for so long. And how many of us are like Zechariah? There are times we have trusted God for things and trusted God until the time we come when our faith can also falter. And I want you to just see this. All of a sudden, there he was serving. And he was serving at a time, a very important time. You must understand something about the priesthood. In this priesthood, we must understand that there are different orders of priests, and I'll touch on this at the time. But here now, Zechariah, he was a barren man with a barren wife. And so now the Apostle Luke places this very important story. And here you see this, Zechariah. Zechariah, funnily, in the Hebrew language means Yahweh remembers. He had a good name, a name that should remind him constantly that God is not a man that should lie. <laughs> when God has said something, God would definitely do it. Is God a man that would have to repent because he did some, said something and did not do it? Obviously not. But you know, with that name, even a good name, Yahweh remembers Zechariah perhaps had waited so long until his faith had really faltered. I could see this scenario now. Here comes the angel. And the angel began giving a message and, and perhaps the angel started by saying, Zechariah, I come with hope for you now. God has heard your prayer and God answer your prayer. And I could see perhaps Zechariah saying, prayer? Which prayer? I mean, he's not trying to be funny. Because perhaps they laid so many prayers that many of us, we laid so many requests. And many of us come with many requests. And too often, we, after a while, have no expectancy to receive because we forget. And perhaps Zechariah was saying, which prayer now? I mean, I don't think at any one moment did he think that his prayer to be a father was going to be answered. Because in his mindset, looking at a circumstances, situation, he is already too old. His wife already too old. I could see like Abraham. You know, Abraham at stage two was like Zechariah, waited so long. He was about 100 years old when God changed his name, the Bible says. Yeah, he was called Abram. And when he was told that he was going to be a father, he laughed. Hmm. But guess what? God always has a last laugh. And God added the word, ha, <laughs> to his name. And Abram become Abraham, a ham. <laughs> Christmas season. <laughs> but we must understand that God never forgets. And so here, after introducing this couple, a barren couple, Elizabeth also has a good name. Elizabeth really translated in Hebrew means God is my oath. Or that she is a worshipper of God. A good name. And the Bible says they were both well along in their years. Well, how old? We don't know. But we can say in those days, when the Bible talks about being old in your years, it was about my generation. 
That was the beginning of a time of agedness. When you reach 60 and above. Amen. Not going to tell you when. <laughs> but that is always a time. But you see these two couples, despite everything the Bible says, they have been upright. Right? They are upright and more. The word upright means righteous before God. Even though they have not received what they've asked for, it did not cause them to falter to change their mind. And this is something that is so important. It talks about having perhaps the right attitude, the right focus with the right objective. Too often if we focus just on an objective that we, of something we want for God, and for when we wait too long and don't receive, we lose heart. I've had people that come to me and say, Pastor, you know, I've trusted God for this, trust God. Can you pray on behalf, tell God, if He doesn't give me what I want, I'm going to leave him very soon. Too often, we have too many alternatives in life. And we have not learned like this barren couple, that despite of barrenness, they did not lose focus, nor did they lose what they believed was their calling in life. Now, the calling, I'll tell you this, that calling was also in the very dark days during the bloody reign of somebody called Harold the Great. This was a time where perhaps we can talk like the times that we are in today. Time of uncertainty, times of confusion, a time of perhaps lawlessness. Things are happening even right now. And it will come to a point, let me tell you people of God, there's nothing get distressed about it. Jesus said all these things must happen. And I want to tell you this, that as you see, the end draw near, know that lawlessness will increase. Because how else would then prophecy be fulfilled where that son of perdition will come as that one world ruler to pro provide a false peace? You see, always when God has given us a hope and a future, the devil also has a plan. A plan to bring discouragement. A plan to bring distress. A plan to bring confusion a plan to bring helplessness and hopelessness. And if we don't keep our eyes as this old couple did on God, and understand this, yes, in the priesthood then, there were two types of priests the Bible talks about. There was Levites and there were priests. Now they all come from actually the tribe of Levi. But the difference was that the priests were people who had a direct descent from the line of Aaron. Now, understand this. For a priest, for example, even from the line of Aaron, there was no requirement that he had to marry another woman from that line of Aaron. But this man had a double honour in a way because he was married to Elizabeth. And the Bible tells us that Elizabeth was also from that priestly line, so to speak, from also the line of Aaron. And here you see this. Now, the particular event, he was selected to burn incense. Now, understand there are different orders, even in priesthood. There is about, if you look at the Bible itself, about 30 divisions. And each were selected to serve in a temple for a period. And in that period they were there, one of the most important things was to light the incense. And that was something they would select among the order of priests. And here he was from the order of Abijah. Abijah is about the eighth priesthood in rotation. So he was there, selected. Now, this selection is very important. You see, at any one time, they say, there were at least any day from that order, at least 50 priests serving there, and maybe 300 priests in that week. And when they choose a person to officiate, he becomes the honoured person. He's the one that goes in the time of the lighting of incense. And incense always speak about a time of prayer. The Bible reminds us that the prayers of the saints are incense before God. So he was a man that performed a very important role. Not just the physical lighting, but symbolically as he liked in there, as he bowed his head, he was the intercessory agent at that time between God and the rest of men. 
And none could go in except this officiating priest. They say he was offered help by two persons. One would be to bring the incense to him before he goes right into that holy place. And the other was receive the empty uh, censer where the incense was placed. And none could go in. And you know, this was such important selection because of the large number of priests that they had this tradition. You can only be selected once in your lifetime. So it's by lot. And even if you get a lot, means you officiate only once in your lifetime. So it is a tremendous honour for this man. A tremendous time. A time that he would never experience again in his life to be the officiating priest, so to speak. And he was there. And all of a sudden, he encountered encounter with an angel. Let's look at what the, angels, the angel actually said to him. The first thing the angel said to him was, Promise one, Elizabeth will bear you a son. Elizabeth will bear you a son. You see, I want to tell you this. We must understand something about our God. Our God has a plan. And our God is a God that wants to reveal to you. If you are faithful, I want to tell you this. You can have an unction from the Lord. 1 John 2.20 To be able to have knowledge to function in the unction that God calls you to. The anointing that God calls you to. God is faithful. More than faithful if you are but faithful. And so here comes that promise, Elizabeth, obey your son. And in that promise, there was a name to be given. As when Jesus came, there was also a name given. And here the name was John. Now, what does that name John mean? In the old Hebrew word, the word John, Johan really means what? Yahweh is gracious. You know, every time I look at my, one of my grandsons, he's called John too. And I always remember this, Yahweh is gracious. And that's a name itself, a name that was given. Now, in that name and in birth, the angel said, he will be a joy and a delight to you. He will be a joy. He's going to bring certain things into our life. Now, next one. Not only joy for you, but joy, many will rejoice because of his birth. So we see this rejoicing. Can you imagine how the joy would have been if you had waited for so long and all of a sudden you're going to be a father? Huh, I don't know what happened. You'll be so, so excited. When you go back, you can tell your wife and your wife will get so excited. Before you can even go back, tell your wife probably the moment you come out and you see everybody, you'll be telling everybody, I'm going to be a father. Hmm, the man that was known to be having a barren wife is going to be fruitful. So can you imagine that joy? And not only the joy there, but the angel began to tell him, he'll be great in the sight of God. He's going to be given a great role. Wow. To any father, to hear that the son is going to be a great son, you know, it's a great joy. Somebody once said this, you know, the greatest achievement a father can have is to have a son that will achieve more than what he can achieve. And this is true, I think. Most of us as fathers, loving fathers, we want to see our son not only be like us, but be able to overtake and be even a greater person than what we may be. I don't know about you, but I believe every father has this hope. Not only that, there was also a promise, the angel said to him, of consecration, that he was never to take wine or any other fermented drink. So we understand that is a Nazarite vow. You know, and this is not just a commitment to priesthood. Sometimes as father, we pray like crazy. I remember when the word was given to two particular children of mine that they're going to be pastors one day. Well, how many know that we can only pray? Each of them have backslided. One is back, the other one is still, we are still praying because too often they want to try to run away 
from the high calling that God has in your life. Somebody say amen to that. And this is important for us to understand. And not only that, another, not only to be consecrated, but to be empowered. I like the promise the angel said to him what? Luke chapter 1 verse 15, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. Do you know this is a promise that is very rare in the Old Testament. There was the anointing that came from man, but there was no talk about the filling. As to whether he was really indwelling the Holy Spirit, I don't know. But this is only selected for special people. And to this we understand this, that there was a special anointing upon the life of John because he was the forerunner of who? The Messiah to come. He was the forerunner, okay, to establish the path. And this we need to understand. The Bible says that, the next verse, that verse 16, that many people of Israel will be brought back to the Lord, their God. He will be instrument of repentance. And their prophetic calling, he will go forth before the Lord in the spirit and power, Elijah. Wow, fulfillment of prophecy. What is he to do in that? He will make ready a people to prepare a people for return of the Messiah. Now remember, Israel had been waiting. For years, they've been waiting and waiting. There had been 400 years of silence already. No prophetic word was given in that 400 years between the Old Testament to the coming of Jesus Christ. So can you imagine now a new prophetic word? What a great joy. If I was a father having this promise, I, I don't know, I'll be jumping and leaping. But look at what happened. Outside the temple, people was there. People were waiting for him to come out. Usually, after lighting incense, he would say a prayer, then he'd come out the holy place. But the people were waiting. And when they waited, when he came out, what happened? They knew he must, something must happen because he was so long in there. What? They were looking at him and said, something happened. We can see in your face, something happened. Zachariah, tell us what happened. <laughs> you struck them. That joy that would have been his to share, he could not share. He, all he could do was just straight and perhaps telling. And you know, when you're trying to say all the things, people are wondering, what, you're going to get pregnant? What, old man, you're going to get pregnant? You, I mean, I don't know how he was trying to gesture to tell the people. And I want to tell you this. This is first thing that we understand. That joy was stolen because of what? Unbelief. <clears throat> you see, God will often send even prophets to give us confirmation of things that you've been asking God for. And you can lose the fullness of even the joy of what God has, if not sometimes the promise unbelief. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 verse 19 that Abraham did not lose the promise to unbelief. He could have lost the promise. Many of us to unbelief could have lost the promise. But here we see something. That God had a plan and God was not to be thwarted. God had the plan and nothing would hinder God's plan for the coming in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ, to be born in a line of men. Amen? And by God's grace, when he went home, the Bible says, what happened? Sure enough, first Elizabeth got pregnant. But again, I'll show you how the joy is lost when he went home. He couldn't even tell his wife. Now the wife got pregnant. He can't even rejoice by going out telling everybody. He will run him. Mm, 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 mm. I tell you this. Perhaps we understand that if we do not hold fast onto the destiny, the calling that God has your life, you can accomplish much disappointment. But I thank God that God's grace is always more than sufficient if we can but turn back to God. And here, I can tell you something. I am I'm just letting my imagination go. In this event 
some things were accomplished. Somebody was just talking to me this morning. Why do we celebrate Christmas for? People tell me Christmas, Jesus was not born in Christmas time. How many agree? Yeah, I'm not going to go that way. I preach about it. And the Bible tells us certain signs why Jesus could not have been born in December. But you see, from the mark of this, we can begin to understand too, there was a sign as to when Jesus would also be born or conceived. Abijah, was, they served in that course between March and June. So he probably went home, the wife conceived in June. And the wife hid it for five months. Correct? And when the news became known, what happened? Mary went to visit after they encountered the angel. And John leapt in the womb of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth had a prophetic word and said, Blessed be your womb. That time conception took place. So you can see this. Six months after conception of John was probably when the seed was placed in Mary's womb. See, this event was also, always events that God do are related for His glory. It's never in isolation that God does something without a meaning, a purpose, a plan, and an outcome. Amen? So we see this story. And we understand this, the different events. But I ask this question, what are the lessons for us? What are the lessons for us? Well, I would say two primary lessons as I was meditating upon this. And the first is that John's birth is of vital importance to God's plan. Although things were hidden in the Old Testament, Understand that through Jesus Christ, they are revealed as mysteries in the New Testament. Mysteries for us to what? Uncover under the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And I began to see this for the first time. That, that bit of importance of the information there and what God is doing. Herald by the angels for what? That we need to pay heed to messages that God will also send to us. You know, in the time of preparation for Christmas, too often we are caught up with the minors. We are caught up with, I'm, I'm not saying these are not important, decoration. We are caught up with buying presents. Okay? We don't understand this plan. You know, you all heard me quote this. It came from the movie Kung Fu Panda. You remember I said, you see, things of time is in the hand of God. And God has a reason for the season. And in this movie, part of it was this wise sage. He was talking to all the rest of the animals. And he said something. He said, remember, the past is history. The future is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. I mean, we're trying to be smart, playing with words. But it's true. The past is history. But there are lessons for us to learn from history. If we understand the lessons, and if we can appropriate what the lessons are in the time of John to his parents, and for us as believers, I won't tell you, the history will never repeat itself we will have new things. The future is a mystery to us as human beings. But if we understand it, God says, will I do anything without revealing it to my friend Abraham? Are you not also heir to that promise? Galatians 3.29 If you be in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Will God not tell you? Would He withhold and surprise you? No. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. And the future need not be a mystery, but in that relationship with God. God will reveal. He doesn't reveal you everything. I've learned to live one day at a time because that's what God reveals, how we're to live the day. He may show us the calling. He may show us the destiny. But, you know, as God initiates and God positions us, giving us different times and position in His plan, 
what happens? It's about our faithfulness. And this is an important lesson. Are we going to be faithful? Or can we be lose that to unbelief? And this is important. First lesson to learn from the life of John or what God is doing. And how God will reveal to us as well as He did to Zechariah. Another important thing is we must avoid an attitude of unbelief. Yeah. A lot of times I said, you know, I was just imagining it. We ask prayers and then we forget. Why? Jesus said, you need to speak the mountains and you must remember, do not doubt. But believe what you ask for come to pass. Many of us, we ask a lot of things. Then we forget because we have no belief in our heart that what we ask for will come to pass. And not only that, in the Mark chapter 11, verse 22, 26, Jesus talked about having an expectancy to receive. Many of us can ask and have great expectancy, but we lose expectancy. Why? Because we are determined by our timing. That's what we call time in the time of fairs or fairs of men as chronos. But to God, God's time is Kairos. God is not limited by days, hours, minutes, seconds. His time is perfect. When is perfect? When God says that's the time, that's perfect. Please understand something. Because it's infinity, the word of God says to God, one day can be a thousand years, a thousand years, one day. But we are finite people because we are in this flesh. But yet, understand something. We have a promise of eternity also. And we must understand, God's timing is often, what? Influenced by our response. So this is an important lesson also. Are we not only just being faithful? Are we trying to understand the way that God wants to do it for our lives? Are we looking at how we can be also fruitful for God? Remember, I talked about the garden experience. Are we also understanding this, that we have a accountability? And as we do it God's way, in obedience, that's the key. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that should repent, the Bible says. Numbers 23, verse 19. Has he said it? Will he not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not make it good? So we must avoid, I believe, that very important, the attitude of unbelief. But you see, to avoid unbelief, we must understand something. Zechariah, even Nicodemus, was both righteous, godly men. Faithfully serving God, but had become spiritually dull. This is an important lesson for us. I challenge you with one question as we prepare, even as we celebrate Christmas. Have you become faithful but spiritually dull? Have you become totally not sensitive anymore to the things of God? Are you walking in God's way but yet failing to understand His heart and what is important to Him? You know, spiritually seeking is a very important qualification for those that want to partake of the things of God. Challenge today as you prepare. Have you spent time? You know, one of the things that became important to me about preparing is Mark 1, 35. And Jesus said this in his own words. And Jesus wake up early in the morning, before the break of dawn. And there he went to a quiet place. And there he prayed. You see, he said, I can do nothing except what I see the Father do. He said, I'm one with the Father. But I'm one because of relationship, because of time spent. And we can see this even in the life of Jesus. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 shows us he was so busy healing, healing, healing. And then in verse 17, talks about him teaching. But in verse 16, one simple verse. He withdrew into wilderness, and there he prayed. You see, 
if we don't spend the time with God, how do we expect to hear? How do you expect to be given the confirmation? How do you expect to be spiritually alive? Many, many people can be believers having a form of godliness, but yet denying the power of God. And this is important. We have been made to be a people of power and a people of praise. Okay? A people of glory. Now, question as I end this. What can we do to nurture this attitude of faith? And I want to leave this with you to think about. The first thing, I think it begins with the word of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It was a time that Solomon was consecrating the temple. The temple that his father David had left him all the resources to build. And as he was there, consecrating the word of the Lord came to him. If my people who are called by my name will first humble themselves. You know, one of the things that steal God's promises is when we lose humility before God. When we can be proud and arrogant even with success. And we can think that, hey, in success, I don't need God anymore. I've done it. I've learned to do it this way. This is the way it's done. I'm going to do it this way. But how do you know God is unique? Yes? And God's asked you to rest in Him to do it His way. Humble themselves. Pray. Even the way we pray is as you pray, seek my face. Many of us are praying not seeking the very face of God. We pray to what? Seek what we want from God. <laughs> That's the difference. When you seek just for fulfillment of your desires, you're looking for the gift and you're not interested in the giver. You're looking at the provision and you're not interested in the provider. When you have the healer, you have your healing. When you have the giver, you have the gifts. When you have the provider, you have the provision. Psalm 23 says, When the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. Question, has he become the shepherd of your life? Has he become Lord of your soul? Or are you still driven by your own ambitions, your own circumstances? He says, seek my face. No need to seek his face. Pray, seek his face. Turn from your wicked ways. What is wicked before God? It's our works apart from God. You see, faith demands works. But too often, we are trying to do our works not of faith, from hearing from God, but our works based on the faith in our desire to want to see things. Now, God is not saying you can't have desires. But the Bible says very clearly, you commit your ways to God. He will then grant you the desires of your heart. Amen? This is the question about focus. And I think it's important. How do we continue in the attitude of faith, of belief, of spiritual sensitivity and openness? Second Chronicles say this, not only seek my face, turn from the wicked ways, but here comes the promise as was given to Zechariah. God says what? I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins and heal the land. But there was in the next verse of 15 an even greater promise and my eyes be open looking at you, and my ears be attentively hearing your prayers. Isn't that wonderful? That in that relationship, it's not just about the promise of God. The promise of God becomes a yes and amen through a walk of faith, through that relationship with God that keeps us in the path of faithfulness that brings us to the position of obedience. Amen? This is important. And as I was asking myself this, how do I do that? You know, the Lord led me to Psalm 51. David's prayer. How remember that song? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Right? And renew the right spirit within me. You see, Sometimes you've got to ask God to create a new heart in us again. You know how a new heart is created? When your mind gets renewed. 
The Bible says in James 1.21, it's the engrafted Word of God. Not just knowing the Word of God, engrafted Word is implanted, that it becomes life and spirit through the Holy Spirit. That all of a sudden your mind becomes renewed. You begin to see things through the eyes of God. Your heart will become changed, and out of abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Renew. Ask God to do it. That's why He gave the Holy Spirit. He wants to begin the work of change, a work of transformation. Nothing that we can do in our own strength and our own ability, in our own knowledge, can there be a transformation in our life. We can try to act it. We can, mm, don't quarrel. We can do this. Mm, mm. But I can tell you this. No matter how you try to control yourself, in this thing no, dwells no good thing, your flesh. The things you do want to do, you will certainly end up doing. And the things you want to do, you end up not doing. But it's a hope. Yes. The promise and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Spend that time in building relationships. That's what the Lord said. You know what David asked? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Amen. Some people want to read it. Restore. Sometimes when we get saved, wow, we've got great joy in the Lord. After a while, no more joy in the Lord. <laughs> Ask God. He wants to restore the joy of his salvation, right? And this is important. Because why? If you don't ask God for that, not that God cannot give you. God is ready to give you. But he's waiting for a willing spirit. You know, the Lord says something. A broken and contrite heart, he will never despise. And this is how I'm just giving you some steps. Huh? How do you have that broken and contrite heart? Begin by, you need to hear, you need to read, you need to study, you need to internalize, you need to meditate upon the Word of God, you need to allow the Word of God to be activated in your life. Join CVSOM. <laughs> okay, if you didn't know what I mean, that's our school of ministry. Okay, and where does faith come from? Relationship, faith comes from yeah. hearing. Amen, that's what silent retreats are for. That's why we teach you about, why? Hearing God's voice. And in conclusion, by God's grace, Zechariah did not face disgrace forever. Amen? Because God is not a man. But that nine months as the baby was being born, he could have been experienced great joy from the time he came out from the holy place to the time the birth took place. He couldn't share the joy. He may have tried to experience a joy. But that joy was not in his heart. And this is important. God wants that joy to be a work. Where do you find joy? May I say this? In the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. What is, why is joy so necessary? Because the joy of the Lord will be your strength. It's a strength to keep you, to sustain you, even through difficult moments, because as we live in this world, understand something. Jesus said, you will have problems. In this world, there will be tribulations. Remember, he didn't say in this world, you've got no more problems because you're a believer. In fact, you're going to have big problems. If somebody told you when they accept Jesus, you have no more problems, I'm going to say that's a lie. Because Jesus said, you have problems. But Jesus gives us the eternal assurance that in Him we have peace. And in that peace, as He has overcome, we will overcome. So in conclusion, this is what I'm saying to you. We're all on a journey like Zechariah was on a journey. But today we are on a journey of faith with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has been given. We are definitely going to have ups and downs. There will be slums. But as you walk with Jesus, He is the one that will be refining, honing, enabling, strengthening. I want to tell you this. God is not only a covenant-making God. He is a covenant-initiating God. He is a covenant-keeping God. And He is a God that enabled you to be part of His covenant. Amen? Amen. So let's quieten our hearts even right now. And Father, I ask this in closing. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive each and every one of us here, Lord. 
for our incidents of unbelief. Sometimes God, even I have mistaken my religious bent for genuine faith. Lord. But your word reminds us that faith does not come because of my zealousness alone. So through this, Father, what I've shared on Zechariah's life and a message, I'm going to ask, Lord, that you build faith afresh in my heart, in the hearts of my brothers and sisters who have heard this word. And we thank you, Lord, even right now, that, God, we can have repentance, Lord, from our unbelief. And, Lord, we can have the bonus even right now to be able to step forward without hesitation. Lord, understanding this, your promise, your assurance is really fulfilled in what Jesus did. And we need to come to appropriate embrace. So, Lord, be the vision even right now. Be the center of our lives, Lord. And God, this is our cry and this is our prayer today. As we prepare even for celebration of this Christmas day, be the center of it all, Lord. And help us prepare our lives. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.